So art, a moving story. So I have um, been doing this for about 26 years. Um, I started out as a nurse, wasn't very good at it. Um, I then worked in an office and I was okay at that. And then I was, I, on the side, became a private investigator and ended up um, repossessing cars for rental companies, which wasn't, it was okay, but it was no civil shepherd moonlighting stuff. I thought it was not what I thought it was going to be. Um, and I segued into, uh, first of all, moving um, household goods for a large company. They then, they had a, a part of their division, a division in their company, which did art moving. Um, they asked me if I'd do that because no one else seemed to know anything about it. Um, I did have an interest in the arts and I do know a lot of artists. So I grew up with a lot of artists. Um, so I had an interest to start with. So I've segued through all of that. I've owned my own business. I've done project management for Caldwell Public Art Projects. Um, and now I've been at IAS for seven years. So I've sort of fitted a lot in. Um, I don't know everything, and every day there's something new to look at, which is why I love my job. And a new conundrum, um, a new problem to solve. So, art, a moving story. So things we love to look at. We love to look at kids. This is my daughter Ruby, she's now 11. She's really embarrassed, so I was gonna show you that. <laughs> Um, we like travelling and looking at things overseas. We like craft. We like looking at history. So there's something we all like to look at. Animals, pets. This is my dog Reg and Max. Um, this, is a, this is a bit old, this photo, because um, Reg has now gone to God, um, but Max is still around. So, we probably all agree on this because we're here, we love art. So, art is one of those things we can all, I think, I've never met a person that has not been able to tell me something that they like in the art world. You know, there's, there, it doesn't matter how negative someone is, there's something that they've seen that they like. But have you ever thought about how it got to the gallery, how it got to the park, how it got to the house, how it actually got to where you're now looking at it? That's all some of us think about. <laughs> this is Andrew that I work with. <laughs> and this was an actually, this is a photo I've had for ages. Um, and this is in my office. I've got these crazy cardboard animals. So, case study. Sounds very boring, but I'm sure it won't be. So, broth. This was one of the most nerve-wracking things I've ever moved. So this is broth from 1888. Louis Pasteur supplied this broth, supplied 12 of these sealed flasks. So it's a glass flask and it's sealed at the top. The broth itself is as clear as anything, but at the very bottom there is a set, uh, there's a sediment. So like whenever you make any broth, you know, you get that sediment that's going to fall to the bottom. This could not be shaken. The sediment could not be lifted because it'll make the broth, the broth will take ages to go back to clear again. So this was supplied by Louis Pasteur to, in an attempt to eradicate the rabbits um, in the late 19th century. So this was the most important thing that this museum owned and this is part of the um, University of Sydney's um, pathology museum and they were getting a brand new beautiful museum so we had to move that this was what their old museum looked like. You can't see any of these things properly 
you probably don't want to. They're just bits of bodies. Um, so they were moving into this brand new museum and this is it in its new spot. Still completely clear. The thing with my job is sometimes when things get really nerve-wracking, I can't take photos because I'm too busy uh, fussing about what I'm doing and making sure that things are right. So I do not have, in all the photos I have, I do not have a photo of it packed. But it was packed very much like the way Brendan's been packing things um, that I've seen today, the ceramics. So there was a box and it, it was nestled with foam and Tyvek, which is a papery um, product which we use for protection. It travelled perfectly, not a problem. So I was so, so relieved. But the day after I'd taken this photo, I went back there, we were doing something else, and it wasn't there. And I was like, oh my God, what's happened to the broth? And the, someone had taken away to photograph it and just picked it up, carried it, put it down, <laughs> brought it back, and it was cloudy. I was like, well, yeah, so it was that nerve-wracking, but it got there. Stella, how fantastic is this? Like, it's a great work, but it's 3.05 3 3 metres high, centimetres high, 305 centimetres high, 914 long and 7.5 deep. For those of you in the audience who would like to know, that's 10 by 30. It's really, really big. It is so big that the gallery had to build a wall over it to, because um, they couldn't get it out of the gallery, they couldn't work out how to get it out. So there had been a wall over this work for 20 odd years. They eventually uh, redid that gallery and pulled the wall down. And that's when they went, oh, oh, okay, so that's where that went. So is that why the good stuff clip they just found behind the door over here? Exactly, <laughs> it is, exactly the same thing. And when I heard that story, I thought, ah, oh, Stella. So it is big and really hard to move. So this is a high cube 40 foot container. So it's higher than the usual, the usual 40 foot container. Um, and the guys here are like, okay, I don't think it's gonna fit. We're like, oh, we've done it before, of course it's gonna fit. So it is a huge exercise to move this. It is so big that we can't wrap it because it won't fit in the 40 foot high cube container if we do wrap it. So it's a job and a half. It's an apps, yeah. This is a dock leveller, which makes life so much easier. Um, it goes into the truck, and then we have to screw timbers into the truck so it doesn't slip. But it literally just fits. It's an absolute bastard of a thing to move. The last time we moved it, um, Admittedly, there was a lot of gallery staff, which are often a lot, you need a lot more than that of those than people who lift things all the time. There were about 18 people on it. So it's a, it's a sizable move. And I just got a phone call the other day that it's moving again. Can you organise the 40 foot high cube container, can you? And as a, as a suggestion, just for interest, you might want to drive the 40 foot high container over a weigh bridge before you put it on, then after you put it on, to get an idea of how much it weighs. That's a really good idea, but in Sydney, to there get out of the city for a weigh bridge, yeah, yeah. So, and because the other thing is, we have to do this when the conditions are correct, because of its size, we can't use a reefer container or a container which is, um, air-conditioned in any way, or insulated. So if only this would work, 
how to distract an Egyptian god. That's my joke. You like it? It's very funny. Okay, so this um, is part of the collection of um, the Maclay Museum at Sydney University. They have a large Egyptian collection and we do a lot of work there for them. So this, um, we have to lift up one, we jack it up one piece of wood at a time. So we jack up one side, timber. Jack up the other side, timber. Because it is so heavy and we need to be able to get something underneath it to be able to get it out of there. Um, there's a lot of, with what we do, there is a lot of standing around and looking at things and making sure everything is okay and double checking. So sometimes things take a lot longer than you would think they take. Um, but we've done it many times before, so we're now used to it. The, so they're doing this piece by piece. Every time we add a timber, we have to screw that timber into the next timber because you're just creating a tower. Um, the Phil, who's here holding the, the um, screwdriver, he will create this and then that ends up getting chucked out unless we can use the timbers for something else because they're not, they'll be used again when we undo it but then after that, it's already been screwed in a heap of time, so we probably don't have a use for it, which is a waste. So, if you see, what's this one? Here, there's a trolley underneath it. So we jack it up to the height that we can fit a trolley. Then we've wrapped that. We've wrapped it in Tyvek and lots of pads. We need to not wrap it too much because we need to be able to know where we're holding it and and. Every, as you're moving it, we're checking it the whole time. So, this is a small crew for moving something like this, but we do have um, a couple of these guys do the work of two men. They're really strong, so that's always an advantage. So, we push it through the building, onto the truck. This is where it's being delivered into. This floor is a painted cement floor, so that's fine for us to work on that. This floor, timber floor, um, the wheels tend to skid a little bit on the floor. It's so heavy, I don't know how it happens, but we've worked out that we just have to put timbers down anyway. So we put timbers down, take it to where it's going, and go through exactly the same process, undo it, and then come down with the with the timber again. This is my favourite, I think. Barge. Okay, so sometimes we can't get things out through the front door because sometimes people have houses which are ridiculously bad access and they like to buy big artworks to go in those houses. So this is your basic waterfront mansion. Um, it's I'm sure everyone's house, mine certainly looks like this. Um, so this house, these are the real estate photos. Um, it was literally packed with artworks. A lot of them we were able to take out, um, these smaller works. Of course all the small works were on the ground floor. Um, so they were really easy to get out. They had building work done after, at the front of the house, the street side, after all of the works had been delivered in. So the access was just completely changed from when they bought the works. So this is where the house is. So, oh, you just the little view of the Harbour Bridge there. Oh, animal sculptures. Yeah, they are, and they left those there, they're bronzes. They were gorgeous, though they left them there. Didn't want those. Um, so that's the scenario. Um, this 
Where that arrow is, that bit going up that way is the driveway. So that house is behind it. That's a new house being built. The road is on the other side of that brown roof structure. So, yeah, it's a great house. So, the first idea. We will build some travel frames and we will use a crane, the, a huge crane that we had to block off the road, permits and everything. We will lower it down the face, put the artwork in and then we'll lift it back up again. We'll lift them back up again. I said, I think we should just try it with the empty travel frame just to make sure that that's going to work. The wind on the water, this travel frame was just, if I could have attached the video, I would have, it was just blowing everywhere. So we went, no, I can't do that, I have to think of something else. So, the second idea. The works were, and there were only five works that couldn't fit out, but these are worth um, more than my house in Sydney. Like, I think one of these, one of these was nearly $2 million. There's five of them. Um, so we wrapped it multiple times, multiple, multiple times, then used foam. Um, it's, that's got um, shrink wrap as well as as layers of bubble and lots and lots of men. So it's, there's two pool cleaners in this pool. Sorry, just my husband noticed that. <laughs> two pool cleaners. Um, so we lowered, everything had to be lowered down to the ground level where of course there were no paintings that we had to do this to. Um, so we lowered them all down, piece by piece. We were so close to the pool, it was nerve-wracking. Um, then we put them onto this, the barge company has this, um, this frame that is fantastic. Um, we can get lots of works on that. We've used this for lifting on cranes as well, and the barge company is happy to loan it to us for other jobs. Um, the, the works get strapped to that. The, the crane on the barge lifted it over to here. We attached it all to here. This is the day before the house settles. So settlement for this house is the next morning at 10 a.m. So these works have to get out because the people who have just bought this house have said anything you leave there, we're keeping. So, as you would if you just bought that house, I suppose. So, we're all ready to go. Barge is there. This barge is has these big pile drivers. They actually go down into the seabed. So, just to keep it, yeah, keep it stable. So, yeah, we're all getting ready. Then the wind picks up. Oh, we can't do it. It's too windy. I'm like, oh my God, okay, what are we going to do? He said, we'll come back in the morning when there's not as much wind. We'll come back at 5.30 in the morning. Okay, let's do that. 5.30 in the morning. It's raining. It was not only raining, it was windy. It was absolutely dreadful. The crew were all looking at me. The boys are all looking at me going, are we really going to do this? I'm like, well, we have to. Because the people that own these artworks wanted that they didn't care what happened, they wanted them out. So, and they'd left it to the last minute. So, if we ordinarily we would do this a week before settlement for this sort of job. So, they set up the crane. This, some of the guys had to stand really close to the pool with the guide ropes. So we lifted it up. It did have to go, it was about five metres of sea that we had to lift over. And it was, I was very anxious. 
So it got lifted onto the barge, we covered it up. Fantastic. And then the sun came out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, then the sun came out. So if we, I don't know, if we'd waited and started it at 7.30, would have been fine, but the usually, usually the wind is the lowest around 5.30 in the morning. So we do do a lot of um, crane jobs in the city, um, in Sydney and Melbourne. I don't know why, there's just lots of crane jobs there. And we always have to do those really early. So yeah, then the sun came out and the guy that had bought the house was going, he was on the driveway, he was hoping, he was hoping, hoping. He was hoping that they couldn't go out. That, you know. But I did point out to him as I was leaving, well, they were on the bottom, you wouldn't have been up, you would have had to try and hang them all on the bottom floor because you weren't going to be able to get them back up again because we sure as hell were not going to haul them up that side of the house again. So yeah, and the sun came out, great, fantastic. So, 40,000 objects in 55 days. So the Australian Museum needed to convert uh, storage space uh, so that they could have the Tutankhamen exhibition, which is opening early next year. In the space was Australia's largest collection of cultural objects, artworks and archaeological material from the Pacific. 40,000 objects, including Cook and Banks collection, carved figures, slip drums, canoe parts, dance costumes, you name it, there was a bag of doom. No one wanted to pack the bag of doom. Um, yeah, I did. I packed the bag of doom because no one else wanted to touch it. I wasn't sure I'd feel I'm okay. Yeah. I've been fine, exactly. So, before we even started, we had to measure everything. So, this is Tom and Simon. Um, the measuring took us two weeks to get everything, an idea of everything that had to go into timber stillages, which are timber frames, we'll see a picture of those. That was, everything for that part of the loop had to be measured. These are the timber stillages. So we did those in 22 days. We, to get that done, we had to bring people from our office in Seattle. So. My boss owns a company in Seattle, so he said to them, do you want to go to Sydney and do a job? We can't pay you while you're there, but you can have time off. And So they came over. They absolutely loved it, because they just finished a big museum in Seattle. Um, and this was different material that they were going to be handling. So they were really excited to come. So what we had to do is we had all of the stillages, these stillages, we had them made in our um, workshop in Melbourne. We didn't have any capacity in Sydney to make them. So we made them in Melbourne and then we set up this on-site store, uh, on-site workshop in uh, the Australian Museum. They have an old schoolhouse there and we were lucky enough to be able to use that, that site. The, the ground and everything, the floor, we had to put um, gator board down because the it's a historic building. So we had to protect everything. Um, and we just made up these stations, these packing stations. And everyone absolutely loved working there. This was our, we had um, three teams. This is the first team. And we took the photo for the first team. After that, I don't think we ever took any photos of the team because we were just all too busy. Like it was, we, we've got a lot of pub photos, I think, on Friday afternoons. So that was our first team. We, lots of objects. Um, in a lot of these slides from this, there are things that are, that are blacked out. That's because there are some things that we can't look at. They're culturally sensitive. So I've blacked those things out. Um, here's two of our American guys there. So every stillage numbered, registered and barcoded. So we had to do that because the new store wasn't going to be ready in time, so we had to bring them all back to our store. So we had to have a way of tracking everything. Um, 
we, one of the guys came up with this great idea. We had all of these plates made um, and just sent in. So they were a little plate and they had holes drilled in them. So that we would just get our strapping and they have a clip, a normal clip, strap with a clip on it, like you would have on a bag. Um, we screw that in there, screw the other side in, and then it just gets secured, tightened and clipped. So it made a lot of those things a lot faster to do. All of the Tyvek, all of that white Tyvek, we had that cut by the distributor. When we bought it, we bought a whole lot of pieces in, in short strips, because usually it comes in a roll, a big roll. And we just made up a dispenser. It was like a toilet paper dispenser, and that sat there on the bench. And they were easy, it was easy just to pull it out, cut it. You didn't have to muck around with what size you were cutting it all to, because it was already small, small enough to use. So it all came to our store in Sydney. Our storage guy said to him, I've got some stillages coming in. He said, oh yeah, how many? And I went, oh, there's 500. He goes, have you got that? I went, I actually need that entire store. So we were luck we're lucky. We've got lots of room for incoming um, and travelling exhibitions. So we just took up that space. So first part achieved. So excited when it was finished. So part two was the object relocation, 40,000 objects, 55 days. So we had to relocate the stillages to Rydal Me, an hour away from our depot, plus pack 40,000 objects and get them to um, Rydal Me in that 55 days. And the reason why the 55 days is the builder was coming to rip out the inside of the Australian Museum and start work, otherwise Tutankhamun wouldn't come. No pressure. So, amazing things, like this was something collected by Captain Cook. Like, yeah, amazing. So the conundrum, shelf to shelf in 55 days. So, the shelves were, the place was so packed, so tightly packed, and an incredible different collection of, of items. Um, and all different, like there's baskets, there's beads, the, yeah, everything was different. There were a lot of these, which was great, but they went into stillages. But the, um, yeah, everything was different. Oh yeah, very different objects, very little time. And because this store was in the middle of the Australian Museum and had been added onto, they didn't know a lot of what they had. So you would move things and find a pole or, or, or find some of this racking and someone would spy something behind it and go, I think there's something behind there. So we'd pull the racking apart and find something there that they hadn't registered, they didn't know they had. Wow, you know, they were excited. There were a lot of exciting things. We found number three, the third thing that the, that the museum had collected. So that was good. Um, the answer was the museum cart. So we used these carts. They look a little bit different to this, but this was the basic idea to start with. Drawers that stacked on each other. So this is what they look like in the end. So there's structural ply, there's two widths, because the shelves come in two widths. So there's shelves which are 60 centimetres deep and ones which are 90 centimetres deep. So we wanted to take that into account. Um, there are two heights, 30 or 40 centimetres, because most things fitted within that range. We had a, a beanbag pillow base, which Ian, my counterpart in our Melbourne office, and his wife, spent, um, I think, three weekends making um, all of these beanbag bases. And standard pillows as space fillers, Duna tops, so we bought Kmart, we buy lots of things from Kmart and their purchasing people must, must get so excited that 
there's been a run on queen size doonas. We bought a whole lot of doonas, we had them cut, sewn down the middle so that we could sit them on top to make sure things didn't move around, no upward movement. Um, and pillows. We bought a whole lot of pillow cases from Kmart. Like they, and I would have people buying pillow cases. I told them what I needed from all different Kmarts all over New South Wales, Victoria and Canberra. And we would fill those and sew them at the top so that we would make everything we needed. Um, and then apply a lid for the top of each stack. So usually those stacks only move three high, only because there's they're heavy to be able to lift. So we unstack them all, load the bottom one, put an empty one on top, stack that, load the next one. So here are the girls, they're packing these ones. So these have got the dunas in the bottom. Um, they come off the shelf in there, they just get nestled in. So we didn't have to actually physically pack anything. Because if we'd have to pack it, we would never have got it done. We'd still be there now. Load number one. This was so exciting. Um, huge lift at the Australian Museum. Slightly bigger than your one here. Um, this, yeah, huge lift. So we were able to fit lots in. It was very exciting when this first load went. Went to the sensational new store, which was just beautiful. So um, the, one of the things that we learned when we were doing this also, we had to line all of the shelves. Um, you can actually buy that in the, you can usually buy it in a big roll. And the lady, I said to the lady, how many rolls I wanted? And she said, oh, do you want us to cut that to size? And I said, oh, okay. So we had the, the um, roll was cut into the width of the shelf, but also they kiss cut it so that we just made up a roller. We would roll it out and there was a perforation. We would tear it, put it on the shelf, tear it, put it on the shelf. Didn't have to cut anything, it was fantastic. So we're learning things all the time while we're doing this. So the first cart, we're all standing there talking about how we're gonna unpack it. Um, Here's more of the things that are blacked out, so you can't see what they are. The museum's conservation staff, the materials conservation staff at the museum, attached things to boards. That was part of what they did in the prep um, that they were doing. There are some things that couldn't be nestled into those bean bags. So what we did, we would just um, drill them, these boards, directly into the carts, and then they would travel like that. It was great. So that's how big they are. They're the 90 wide ones, and they're the deeper, so they're 40 centimetres high. And these skids, we just had a heap of those made up. So they were good for moving. We could move things directly on those, or we could pack into these. So this is the new, this is the old. Like, it was just the old, the old store, there were things that they just couldn't see what they were, what they had. There just wasn't enough space. So the new store is beautiful. And oh my god, we're finished. Oh, that's me. If you see it. So this is in the new museum, this is in the new store, and it's beautiful. I mean they can see what they've got. You can get down um, the aisles. The community can go and visit. Um, they have lots of um, visiting islander people come. Because it's a complete Pacific collection, so they have lots of visitors to it. It's great. Miniatures. So this was a corporate client, and this artwork, the way it came to us, was all of these boxes flattened. So we had to put them together. They're tiny. This is a tub of museum wax. So they're like this big. So we had to put them together. Then we had this 
this is the way they all had to go. So we had to then find, you know, find the go lean crunch. And they're American, so they weren't things that we recognised. So you'd be like, have you got what? Yeah. Um, the go lean crunch, we didn't know what the packet was going to look like, so we had to find that. Um, we were given this map to put, put it out. It was a big job. So we have people who are very patient. So here's Tom putting the museum wax on and then he's just laying them all out. It was his life for, I think it was three days he was there. After we put them all together, just laying them all out. And then the um, director of the company said, I don't know if I like them there. Maybe we could put them in the foyer. And then someone else said, oh no, maybe we could put them. So we've left it with them and it's been there for like two years and they haven't moved it yet. So you only want to move it once. So the random everyday things. So these are just a, a mix of things that... Um, the specialised packing that we do, this, um, this is great. He had to, his arms had to be supported. I thought it was they were covering up his bits, mm -hmm. but no, his arms had to be supported. So until they actually, there's actually blocks under his arms there, under his hands, you can't see them in this image. Um, so we do that sort of packing as well. This is done in our workshop. So in our workshop, things are more, um, unless we set up a workshop at a client's premises, we have to make do with what we've got and we do create things on the go. But here, this is very standard. That's Graham, He's, he hated doing that. He really didn't like that. So yeah, this is Lego. So, um, we do a lot of Lego packs and we do the packing for uh, the Lego man in, in Melbourne and that can be quite um, nerve-wracking because some of those towers are huge. The, we make up things like this, this is just made out of tribal cardboard, it's a stand for the glue gun. So the boys will be doing something and someone goes, oh, can we have some, can some, I need something to put the glue gun on. Hang on a second and someone will make something. And that's what we end up with. It's great. Models. Um, quite an elaborate pack for some models going overseas. We don't tend to um, do as many model packs as we used to because people are tending to do models with 3D printers now and they're a more solid, um, they're a more solid product, so they don't really need as much handling. So what's next? So this is the next move that I'm working on um, and it is an extensive archaeological collection and we will be using those um, museum carts. We will have to build some things for it, but um, it's so much easier for me now having those museum carts and being able to go in here and go, okay, I'm gonna fit, well, those two will go in one cart, two carts, three. It's so much easier than before when I used to have to work out how many boxes I was gonna need because yeah, that was such a waste of um, cardboard, but also time, and time is money. So moving out means I get to look at it most days, which is fantastic. I absolutely love what I do, and I think it's interesting, and I hope you do too. <laughs>